the participants an opportunity to discuss their papers with the others who contributed to the, um, this quite unique project overall. But for me, by far the most important um, aspect of this in terms of what I learned from has been working with Mel Leffler. So I again wanted to thank Mel for the cooperation that he's put in, both to me and to the other participants in this, in this project. Um, I have learned from all the 75 contributors, but there's no one I've learned more from uh, than my co-editor. I also want to thank um, Michael Watson, who is here today. Uh, it's the first of the um, conferences that Michael has actually been able to be at. Uh, Michael has been an integral part of this project from the very beginning, as Mel uh, mentioned this morning. Um, he uh, has helped us enormously on the Cambridge University Press side. He has been pushing relentlessly in order to get good treatment for this project within the CUP system. Um, and he's someone who we are much looking forward to working with in the continuation. Uh, in many ways, for the Cambridge History Project as such, uh, I'm afraid I have to tell this to the contributors who are here. It's now the work really starts to make this into one of three volumes with cohesion and with a lot of good debate uh, between the different uh, participants, the different contributors. I also want to thank uh, two great Washington institutions, the National Security Archive and the um, Woodrow Wilson Center, the Cold War International History Project, for having given us such fantastic help in setting up not just this conference, and that, that's important, but in many ways in terms of where the materials that so many of us base ourselves on in terms of our new interpretation of the Cold War, they are in one way or another related to one of these two fantastic institutions here, run by a series of real enthusiasts, um, people who have been able to contribute enormously to scholarship over the last 10, 15 years or so. Indeed, I think it's right to say, and uh, I think Mel will be with me on this one, that the international, the pluralist, um, and sometimes the rather controversial aspects of this particular Cambridge history would not have come out the way it has if it hadn't been for the methods of work that have been pioneered by the National Security Archive and the Cold War International History Project. Uh, it's one of the things that really stand out when I teach students now in London, and there are some of them who have at least been studying with me here today, um, I often use the Cold War International History Project as a starting point for the kind of new scholarly exchange that is going on within contemporary international history in general. When any new PhD student who starts up is worried about someone else stealing his or her topic, which used to be the case, I always refer them to this continuous cooperation and exchange of documents and exchange of materials and ideas that the Cold War International History Project really pioneered and has been taken up uh, in many other places now. It is a wonderful way of cooperation among historians and political scientists and something that all of us should be very grateful for. The approach that this Cambridge history uses, and I think I've said at the two first conferences that this is not your grandfather's or grandmother's Cambridge history. It's a very different approach. Um, it's much more international. It's much more pluralist. Is, it is much more open to controversy uh, than what has been the case in um, the earlier Cambridge histories going back to Lord Acton's uh, draft uh, for the first Cambridge modern history almost exactly 100 years ago. Um, what we are trying to do here is to present scholarship, warts and all. Uh, we have to be aware of what we do not know. We have to be aware of where the controversy is. We have to be aware of the legitimacy of seeing things differently, depending on where you are sitting or what kind of background you have. And that's something that we have tried to work into this project, and I think to some extent at least have succeeded, thanks to the contributors uh, to the three volumes. That said, the time period covered by the third volume, the one that we will be discussing further here today in the public sessions, and in the workshop sessions for contributors um, tomorrow and the day after tomorrow, it's by far the most difficult one, not just in terms of historiography, which is distinctly underdeveloped, but certainly also in terms of access to historical sources. 
It's a very different situation to move from the 1940s, 50s, and 60s, where we fear uh, sometimes that we are on too well-known ground in terms of the historiography, and on to an area where the historiography is really just being developed, <coughs> dealing with the late 70s and the 1980s. It's also, and this brings me to the panel that we have uh, here today, it is uh, a much more difficult period to interpret because it ends up in such a very different way from way it's, when it started out. Um, it would be very easy to see, both, I think, based on the observations at that time and what we as historians think we know today, that it starts up with the United States that is severely weakened for a whole host of reasons, ranging from economic developments to, to the war in Vietnam to Watergate, uh, a, a set of issues uh, that come up in the mid-1970s, and a Soviet Union that seems to be in the ascendance. And it ends up, of course, with this being turned around 180 degrees and with the Soviet Union collapsing, uh, not just as a superpower, but in the end as a state. And it's difficult to explain this kind of dramatic development, um, particularly when you have relatively limited still access to source materials for, for the period as a whole. So a lot of what will be said in this third volume, and I think Mel and I and others who work on this um, realize that, will have to be tentative and will have to be based on what we think we know rather than the broad selection of sources that are available for the first two volumes. I don't think that necessarily makes it uh, uh, more problematic as history, because history is always based on what you do know, what you do have access to. You can never get a complete or full access or complete take on, on anything. But one has to be more cautious, one has to be more open for different alternatives, uh, and certainly more open for big surprises yet to come in terms of uh, the information that we will get in the future. So it's in that spirit that I think all of us who are up here now approach this um, uh, particular panel. Uh, this morning we dealt with um, the great power perspectives in terms of explaining the end of the Cold War. I, mean, I think we had a very, very fine session this morning. In the third session this afternoon, we will deal with allies, clients, and the end of the Cold War. And the emphasis will very much be on Europe in this session. Uh, we have two presenters uh, who are also writing chapters for the Cambridge history, um, Jacques Levesque and, and Helga Hoftendon, and then Sam Wells, the um, associate director of the Woodrow Wilson Center, will be, will be, be commenting. Now, let me just uh, introduce the, the speakers uh, very briefly. Um, uh, Jack uh, was the founding director of the Department of Political Science at the Université de Québec uh, at Montreal in 1969, and from 1969 um, he's been teaching there. Uh, he's a specialist on Soviet and East European affairs. He's had a long uh, series of books and scholarly articles uh, published both in, in French and in, in other languages. Um, he's worked on various aspects of Eastern European and Soviet international history. He's probably best known, at least among those who use mostly English for uh, their scholarly acquirements, um, for his book that was, was it translated in 97, Jacques? The, the Enigma of 1989? Or was yes, it? Yeah. It was a, when was it published? It was published in 95 uh, in French yeah. and in 98 in English. Right. Uh, the book in English is called The Enigma of 1989, the USSR and the Liberation of Eastern Europe. And it's one of those books that have really set the tune for much of the discussion about the links um, between Soviet policy and policy in the various East European countries re re leading up uh, to the changes uh, that took place uh, in 1989. Now, Helga Haftendon uh, has hang, had a, a, a long and, and very successful career at the Free University of Berlin, where she is now uh, Professor Emerita. Um, she has been, uh, still is, a guest researcher at the German Institute for International and Security Affairs. Um, and she has also worked uh, in a number of other universities uh, in terms of visiting 
positions, uh, both in Europe and in the United States. She's been um, a visiting scholar at Harvard University and, and at Florence and at Stanford University, among, among other things. Um, the most recent book, at least the most recent one that I've read, which is just out in English translation, coming of age, German foreign policy since, since 1945, which is really a magisterial overview. It's a translation of a book that I read in German called Deutsche Außenpolitik zwischen Selbstbeschränkung und Selbstbehauptung, 1945 to 2000. Um, it was uh, published in German in 2001 and now uh, out, in, um, out in English. Um, but Helga has also written uh, a whole series of, of other books that have had a very strong impact on the study of German foreign policy and particularly of German-American relations and transatlantic security <coughs> issues. And then lastly, let me just introduce Sam Wells. It's a bit strange for me to do that here because if the term he needs no introduction actually holds true, it should be for Sam Wells at the, at the Wilson Center where he is the um, the um, Associate Director of the Center and Director of Western European Studies. Um, Sam has been one of those who have really pushed this whole enterprise in terms of looking anew at the Cold War era from the very beginning. He was instrumental in setting up the Cold War International History Project here at the Woodrow Wilson Center. He has been a friend not just to that project, but also to all of us who work on Cold War history and, and Cold War studies since this really started up um, uh, in terms of the new uh, source-based studies after the Cold War in the, in the early 1990s. His most recent book is The Strategic Triangle, France, Germany and the United States in the Shaping of New Europe, which was published last year. No, this year. Was it? Was it, it was published last year, Sam, wasn't it? I actually saw books early 07, but it's got an 06 date on it. So. Well, there you see, there you see. <laughs> Newer than it seems, then. And, Arnie, you should ask that my co-editor and fellow contributor is sitting to your right. Indeed, <laughs> indeed. A collaborative effort, indeed. But it's good to have several collaborators uh, here for this, for this session. Okay, I, what I suggest we do here is that we set off, it's now five past two, we have to about three, for this session. I was hoping um, that we would set off as much time as possible for, for discussions. So I asked the presenters to do about 20 minutes or less than that each. So we'll start with, uh, with, uh, with Jack on the East European revolutions. Jack, please. First, I want to thank uh, Arne and uh, Mel Leffler to have invited me to take part in such a challenging enterprise. Uh, my topic uh, today is the East European Revolutions of 1989. And since our general topic is the end of the Cold War, let me stress that the Soviet acceptance of the serial collapse of the East European regimes in 1989 can be considered and must be considered as, as the single most dramatic and significant event among those leading to the end of the Cold War. It did provide the most uh, compelling evidence of the magnitude of the changes that were going on in the USSR in 1989. Until then, uh, the significance of these events was widely doubted in many places. And the Soviet behavior of 1989 in Eastern Europe was the definitive reality check of the so-called new thinking in Soviet foreign <laughs> policy. It is only then that the Gorbachev revolution, to use Archie Brown's term, fully appeared for what it was. To be provocative, I like to say that it is not so much what happened in Eastern Europe itself in 1989 that was historically significant. The fragility of the communist regimes there had been on the historical record for many years. The fighting spirit of the Polish people had been also on the historical record for many years. But it was just the opposite for Soviet tolerance. Given the USSR's unmistakable intolerance of any significant challenge in Eastern Europe, Soviet domination of the region uh, was deeply internalized around the world as an inescapable fact of international life for an indefinite future. 
That is why the complete emancipation of Eastern Europe in 1989, while Soviet power was still basically intact, came as a breathtaking surprise in the West, in Eastern Europe itself, and even in the Soviet Union. In the chapter that you may have read, I try to show that each of the 1989 revolutions had specific national characteristics and followed comparable patterns of development. But the central argument that I'm trying to make and around which I have organized the chapter is that the pace and the magnitude of each of these revolutions were largely shaped by the gradual discovery of the scope of Soviet tolerance. I insist here on the words gradual discovery, because the full discovery came very late indeed. Highly important changes took place in Poland and Hungary in the spring and summer of 1989, but they were restrained and framed by assumed limits of Soviet tolerance. This also shaped attitudes and behavior towards these changes. It is only in November 89, after the fall of the Berlin Wall, that it was fully realized that there was no actual limit of Soviet tolerance. Uh, in, his, uh, in Eastern Europe. This fundamentally changed both the pace and the nature of transformations all over Eastern Europe. This also changed uh, US and West German behavior towards Soviet interest and power in Eastern Europe. In a nutshell, uh, this is what I've tried to highlight in my chapter. <clears throat> Since the Soviet military suppression of the Hungarian Revolution in 1956, Western Sovietologists and East European political actors alike believed there were two clear thresholds that could not be crossed in Eastern Europe without triggering Soviet military action. This is ending, uh, ending the dictatorship of the Communist Party and its role as the only possible instrument of socialist development and or withdrawal from the Warsaw Pact. As we know, the pact was held as the very core of the so-called world socialist system. Uh, as strange as it may appear now, <clears throat> as late as three years after Gorbachev's arrival in power, these two assumed limits of Soviet tolerance were still hanging around. Two caveats, however. Soviet intolerance did not necessarily mean Soviet military intervention. It could mean different forms of intimidation or pressure on local communist leaders to show force or to use it. Second caveat, given the reforms that Gorbachev had introduced in the USSR, especially since 1988, mm. it was clear that there was room for greater experimentation and tolerance than earlier in Eastern Europe. But of the two old thresholds of Soviet tolerance, only the first one seemed open to only partial reconsideration. This was clearly shown in Poland by the results of the roundtable agreements of, of April 89 between the communist authorities and the opposition led by Solidarity. Uh, these, deep, these agreements meant a very deep system transformation in Poland, but both sides tacitly admitted that Poland's relations with the USSR were not negotiable and solidar solidarity didn't even try to raise the issue during the roundtable agreement. The keystone of the, of the system, the party's leading role, was not even directly challenged, but the party's power was substantially curtailed. The agreements allowed for the entrance of solidarity, so of solidarity in the political system, while the allocation of a, with, uh, with the allocation sorry, of a sizable amount of seats in parliament, and it even allowed for, its, uh, for the eventual entrance of solidarity uh, in uh, coalition government. These agreements ended the party's monopoly of political power, but not its hegemony in the political system that was guaranteed by a prearranged distribution of seats in parliament. Vauensa and his advisors, considered this as the best deal they could get in the national and international circumstances. Mm. 
I will skip over the events that led to the loss of the party's hegemony in Poland in August 89 and the formation of a government led by Solidarity, only to stress that after that, the so-called power ministries remained entirely in the hands of the communists. Above all, General Jaruzelski, just re-elected as president, continued to serve as commander-in-chief of the armed forces and had the constitutional power to dismiss the government, to dissolve parliament, uh, or to declare the state of emergency. The new prime minister, Mazowiecki, had pledged publicly to respect Poland's commitments to the Warsaw Pact, and until after the fall of the Berlin Wall, solidarity leaders did not consider as irreversible the dramatic change that had occurred in Poland. In Hungary, the more self-confident uh, Communist Party accepted in the summer of 1989 to have entirely free elections. If it did so, it was because reliable polls showed that it would remain the main political force in the country. Mm. The leading Hungarian communist reformer, Imre Pozgai, was widely expected to easily win the free presidential election. And, but in order to placate the USSR and Gorbachev, the main opposition parties accepted an early presidential election because it was going to lead to a victory by a communist reformer, and they accepted the introduction of a reference to socialism in the new Hungarian constitution. In a nutshell, again, up to the fall of the Berlin Wall, there was a significant degree of deference to Soviet power and interests in Eastern Europe. This could be also observed in U.S. policies towards Eastern Europe. In the summer of 1989, George Bush visited Poland and Hungary and advised moderation to opposition leaders and recommended them to work in close cooperation with the communist authorities. Until then, the democratization process going on in Eastern Europe was fully in line with Gorbachev's policy of gradual and controlled rapprochement between the two Europes that aimed at the construction of a new European order where the USSR would have had its full place. Well, all of this dramatically unraveled in the weeks that followed the opening of the Berlin Wall on November 9. The opening of the Berlin Wall with Soviet acquiescence was immediately uh, and rightly perceived the world over as a momentous historical event, which it was. It was the single most decisive event for all the Eastern European revolutions of 1989 because it provided the most compelling confirmation that there were not any more Soviet treasures of tolerance in Eastern Europe. It was then that Helmut Kohl became convinced that the new Soviet course was irreversible and that German unification was becoming a possibility. He therefore decided to seize the initiative and put German unification on the international agenda in his famous speech to the Bundestag of November 28. But I will leave the rest of that to Helga, of course. As it became evident that the USSR would not use force under any circumstances and was advising East European regimes against it, rest Respect for Soviet preference and power rapidly evap evaporated nearly everywhere. Over Gorbachev's objections, Bush and Kohl would insist that a united Germany be a full member of NATO, even when it became clear that this would spell the end of the Warsaw Pact. The first signs of the crumbling of the USSR, which had been the keystone of the Warsaw Pact, gave strong impetus to events throughout the region. The fragile political equilibria that had been achieved in Poland and Hungary was rapidly shattered. It is, I like to say, it is Eastern Europe in its entirety that hurled itself through the open Berlin Wall. In Poland, a few months later, General Jaruzelski was compelled to resign the presidency to which he had been elected for six years a few months earlier. In Hungary, a referendum was held on November 26 that canceled the presidential, the presidential election that Imre Pozgai was sure to win. 
In the parliamentary elections that took place a few months later in, in Hungary in May 90, the reformed Communist Party, which was credited with nearly 40% of the popular vote nine months earlier, actually got 8%. In June 1990, when it appeared increasingly clear that Gorbachev would have to accept the inclusion of, United Germ in a, of a united Germany in NATO, the new Hungarian Prime Minister, Joseph Antal, declared at a meeting of the Warsaw Pact that his country wanted to leave it or see it dissolved. Not long, after uh, not long after receiving German assurance on Poland's western borders, the Mazowiecki government reneged uh, its earlier commitments and followed suit. So that is to say, that from, from November on, from November 9 on, a sort of cathartic popular venting became the dominant trend all over Eastern Europe. In Czechoslovakia, where the regime had succeeded in resisting change until then, it was swept away by a peaceful popular insurrection only three weeks later. Mm. The insurrection was peaceful because the regime knew that there would be no support for repression from Moscow. As I show in the written version of this uh, expose, the capacity of the Czechoslovak regime to resist reforms until then was due to a significant degree to ambiguities in Gorbachev's policies that disappeared after November 9. This also applies, I think, to Honecker's regimes. In other words, with the Czech and East German uh, both the Czech and East German regimes were able to resist change to a certain extent, or even largely because of some ambiguities in Gorbachev's policy that remained up to the fall uh, of 1989. Not surprisingly, the last East European regime to fall was the most repressive at all, uh, the Romanian one. The Ceausescu's dictatorship was the only one to leave the stage in a bloody popular revolt that was directly impulsed by what was going on all over Eastern Europe after November 9. By a few days only, Romania did not miss the great historical rendezvous of 1989. Well, the only East European regime of the Warsaw Pact not to be swept away by the wave that followed the opening of the Berlin Wall was Bulgaria's. Only a few hours before the opening of the wall, Bulgarian emulators of Gorbachev had overthrown Todor Zhivkov, the old Bulgarian dictator. They have been able to stay in power long after the German events. And together with the post Ceausescu regime, the new Bulgarian one was a rare success story of Gorbachevism, of Gorbachevism in Eastern Europe. The two regimes, however, uh, not always, I mean, the two regimes never sought the dissolution of the Warsaw Pact but their geopolitical importance was rather negligible and not enough to help salvaging Gorbachev's vision of a new European order. In this brief presentation, I'm quite uh, conscious that I have almost completely neglected the specificity of each East European country that is necessary for a full understanding of what went on in 1989. I did so in order to stress that the key to the momentous change that took place was in Moscow. Mm. And to conclude in a provocative manner, I should also say that the main key to the end of the Cold War was in Moscow and definitely not in Washington, even though, even though the first Bush administration handled it in a remarkably able and efficient manner for US interest. Thank you. Thank you, Judge. Hugo? Yep. On the topic of German unification. Okay. Thank you very much, Arne, for your introduction. And I also want to thank you, both you and Mel, for inviting me to uh, be on this project, which is uh, great fun. And also, of course, I uh, thank the institutions that made this meeting and this project possible, and also Jeff, who put us up in the water and, and made uh, made all the arrangements? This is no small drop. This was no small drop. Uh, what I will do now, I will not read my paper. 
I'll summarize the main aspect. And Sam, you can be quite relaxed. I will not change my argument, <laughs> as I did last week when we were on the same panel. This time, I'll follow the basic line. But I thought it might be a better idea to focus on five aspects. It's a challenging job for me to do, with all the historians being here. Although I'm a trained historian and was a co-editor of the German Documents on Foreign Relations, for 40 years I was taught international <laughs> relations, and I consider myself more part of the IR crowd than I do of the historian's crowd. So in true IR, excuse me, in true IR fashion, I will structure my arguments uh, along five uh, things. My problem is the air conditioning has something negative effect on my voice. So my first point is the interrelationship between the East-West conflict and the division of Germany. I think I want to start with the structural aspect. Since the early 1950s, there was an interrelationship between the East-West conflict, the division of Germany, and the presence of the four victorious powers in the center of Europe. This was a structural element, and not a single one of these structural elements could be changed without affecting the other elements. So you had to focus on all three. Uh, the late 1980s saw changes on three on two of the three levels. Uh, on the international level, on the structural level, co the Cold War was replaced by superpower detente. Again, after first try in the 1970s, which had gone sour after the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, the NATO troop track decision, unrest in Poland, and enactment of of martial law. But I think this morning um, we best talked about it, the various aspects of the relationship, and I very much agree with Strobe Talbot. I think that the CSC process was more important to again making detente possible than was the Reagan strategy. Mr. Reagan came to Berlin, I, I think it was 1988, he stood at the Brandenburg Gate and said, Mr. Gorbachev, open this door. And of course nothing happened. But uh, the, uh, the, 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 the Helsinki Charter did have an impact on the, uh, the countries and also on Russian behavior. I think the reason the Russians didn't intervene uh, in 1980 militarily was also in consideration of some of the commitments they, they had made. Um, another thing, um, so this was the international level. Also on the national level, changes took place. In the Soviet Union, we see Glasnost and Perestroika. We have talked about this. Archie, Archie Brown had a very good paper this morning on this. But I think it was important for Gorbachev to make Russia again, or the Soviet Union par engage the Soviet Union in the war, in the global world and engage it with the with the West, with the United States and the, the European country, and also in order to make the Soviet Union competitive, both in economic and technological terms and in political terms. And for this, he needed cooperation with the West. So um, these, the international setup changed, and uh, the national, some national aspect changed. Next, we see the fall of the Berlin Wall. Excuse me. <clears throat> on November 9th of 1989. November 9th is a difficult date for Germans because in the third, it also relates to two events in the Third Reich. So, uh, but on the other hand, I think it's some irony that we have both 11-9 as an event that changed the world and 9-11 number of years later that again changed the world. Um, wh why did the wall, or what triggered the fall of the wall? 
I think one thing was that Gorbachev no more supported the Honecker regime in in East Berlin. But Gorbachev called for perestroika or supported some uh, amount of perestroika in Central and Eastern Europe. And it was resisted. This move was very much resisted in East Berlin. I think Sindermann had a very nice say. He said, why should we remodel our apartment if our neighbor puts up new wallpaper? Uh, so the regime, uh, the people in the GDR resisted it while liberalization was going on in Eastern Europe. The first free elections um, uh, in Poland, a uh, reform movement, liberalization on hung in Hungary, uh, Jack, Jack has, has mentioned it. I don't have to go into detail. What this produced was growing unrest in the GDR. And what we had there, on the one hand, we saw m thousands of East Germans fleeing from the GDR. They were looking for refuge in the Western embassies in East Berlin. And when this was no more possible, they went to the Federal Republic's em embassy in Warsaw and in Prague and in Budapest, and then the Hungarian regime opened the, wall, the, the Iron Curtain to Austria and let some people go out. There were some arrangements between Genscher and the East German and the Czech regime so that Germans, East Germans from the, or citizens of the GDR could leave Prague via the GDR and go to, to West Germany. Of course, in, in sealed trains, which other people wanted to get on, was a very, very difficult situation. But this, in, again, uh, stimulated increasing unrest in the GDR. And also within the SED, the, so, the Socialist Unity Party, which then, uh, in a coup, replaced Honecker, or made, it, um, or made him resign out of health reasons with the ex explicit blessing of Gorbachev. But the trigger, the actual trigger of the war was an incomplete announcement of Schabowski, who was a kind of press statement, spokesman. When the um, Central Committee had met and, and uh, considered revising travel laws and wanted to have a more liberal uh, travel law. Then uh, Schabowski was given a sheet of paper to announce it to the press, and he announced uh, the, uh, at, at the press meeting that East Germans would be able with their passports to go to the West right. And then he was asked, when is this going to take effect? This was, I think, a, a Thursday night or and he said, oh, I think right now. So people listening to this at the radio, they rushed to the borders and, and was wondering what, what was happening. Of course, the border guards had no idea whatsoever. Then at Bornheimer Straße crossing, uh, the, the crowd swelled and swelled and swelled, and finally they pushed through. So the wall was open. And um, I think um, the, 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 the remarkable thing is that no force was used. Uh, for neither from the uh, of the Russians, even when the when there were lots of demonstrations in Berlin and Leipzig and Dresden and so on, the Russian troops, the Soviet troops, stayed in their barracks, and um, it, we, most people, including those living in West Berlin like me, were not sure whether they actually would stay put or if they would, wouldn't move, the East German army and uh, the troops would move. We knew that the East German army and the uh, so-called, um, and the, the, the pseudo-military people there had given weapons and had been ordered if there would be mass demonstration to use them. And I, I knew a doctor and they, he was told that they had to prepare for blood supplies in the hospitals on November 4th, when there was one of the big demonstrations. But everything stayed quiet, and this is basically, to me, the miracle, that everything stayed put and nobody used force. So the wall was open, and uh, with the wall open, um, basically um, the division of Germany was, was <coughs> overcome virtually. It has still had to be overcome politically, because um, there was the, mm. 
the, there was a political dynamic uh, put into place, set, no, set into motion. And the question was, how would the four powers, I initially told you that the, the presence of the four power was one of those structural elements. How would the four powers react to this process set into motion, to the opening of the war? Um, I mean, the German government, the federal government, uh, was taken by surprise. In fact, Chancellor Kohl and Foreign Minister Genscher, they were in Warsaw at the time, and they had to fly back to Berlin, to a big rally. In fact, they couldn't fly back directly. They had to use American Air Force planes because of the special situation of Berlin and to go to Hamburg and then to Berlin in or for a rally and so on. But what, what Kohl and Genscher tried to do is, at the same time he was again on Western territory and could use uh, telephone lines, not open telephone lines, but uh, for confidential telephone lines, he tried to reassure all four countries. He first called the American president, he didn't get the t president on the phone, but Baker or Skoker, I don't know who was actually on the phone, I had to look it up, and he tried to reassure Gorbachev. So what was the, uh, when then this was set in motion, um, then Kuhl laid out his agenda. On uh, pretty soon, he, um, he went before the Bundestag, and proclaimed his ten points. Um, the tenth point was not unification, but it was uh, more. It was a building trust, a rapprochement between the two German states, and the, and then he was hinting at the possibility of a federation among the two states. In my paper, I go at all the details. I won't do it here. Um, but how would the other three? or four major actors react. The United States did welcome uh, the, the events in Germany. George H. Bush was very positive, and the American press spoke of the victory of the, of the, over the Cold War, or victory in the Cold War, and so on. But I think what was very important is that the United States had immediately a positive approach to it. But, however, the United States wanted to control the dynamic and didn't want to get the dynamic out of control. Um, interesting, oh, <coughs> excuse me, uh, what would the French do? Um, the, the French um, position was kind of ambivalent. I'm hesitating a moment because, because I have a big fight or a big argument ex exchange with Frédéric Bozo, because Frédéric Bozo argues that Mitterrand was all for German unification. I think that Mitterrand was ambivalent, that basically he supported uh, unification because he felt that it was natural that a nation achieves its unity, but he was very concerned that the thing, uh, that there would be a large German state with the population, the resources, and so on. So France and Mitterrand tried to make sure that there was a parallel process of um, the intensification of European integration. Uh, he, he made a couple of steps conditional. This is very, this, the documents are available. The German documents are out, there's a special volume, the f one, much of the French material is available. It's, it's very interesting to see how Kohl and Mitterrand inched along trying to link the process of German in, in, uh, unification with European integration. Um, Britain. Maggie Thatcher was very concerned about the changes in Europe. She was afraid that Gorbachev might be destabilized and that Germany was getting too strong. She spoke of the German juggernaut, and she also was very critical of European integration. So she tried to apply the brakes and frame the process internationally. I mean, uh, to the, 
as to the Soviet uh, response, Gorbachev response, I don't, I'm not able to read the Russian do document. So in this case, I have to rely on secondary sources. I mean, I think that Gorbachev was concerned that the things would go, get, go out of control, but I think others like Wojciech Mastny and Ernie Edge, they could fill us in on the some second thoughts they, ha they had in Moscow. I'm more worst with what happened then when there was a dialogue or intercourse between the, the President Bush and Gorbachev, Baker and Shevard Nartze and Kuhl and, and Gorbachev and Genscher and Shevard Nartze. But I think what is important at this stage is the parallel processes of germ unification, which then led to the treaty on uh, on the final set settlement with respect to Germany. This is a two plus four treaty between the two German states and the four power and negotiating the Maastricht Treaty. The Maastricht Treaty of 1992 is also uh, the end or the result of this process which was started in December in 1989. Okay, my fourth point is brief. It's on the dissolution of the GDR. Um, the events in November they triggered a process of increasing liberalization and democratization in the GDR, which culminated in free elections on March 15th in 1990, which brought to power a uh, coalition government formed by the center, right, center conservative and social democratic forces. It was a kind of a red-black coalition like we have in Germany right now, with Lothar de Maizière as uh, the chancellor, the East European chancellor. Um, what he was inheriting was a desperate situation. Situation: People were still fleeing. The economic situation was bad. Um, the GDR was, was broke. It was very, there was very little chance for it to get additional funds. The, uh, the GDR government was asking the Federal Republic and others for support. However, um, the Federal Republic Cole thought this was uh, a barrel without bottom, and he wanted to make sure that the aid given would would have some news. So what he 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 made a very bold, bold measure. He s said the people should the GDR people should no more come to the Deutschmark, but the Deutschmark should come to the GDR. So this offer of the Deutschmark to uh, for to the GDR people set in motion. Uh, and forming a currency union, it also was necessary to form an economic union. So the first big treaty was a treaty on economic and financial unity, which to some extent or to large extent led the way and set the rules for political union. Because if you have to spell out how tax systems are, how um, trade and things are regulated. You also have to talk about institutions of relations with other countries, relations to the European Union, and, and so on and so on. Uh, so many people thought that there was nothing else necessary. Maybe the Volkskammer, the East German Parliament, could by, by a motion uh, decide to become a member of the GDR. This is what de Maizière, of the Federal Republic, excuse me. This is what de Maizière didn't want to do. He wanted to, uh, to maintain the self-respect of the GDR people. So he asked for a political negotiations with the GDR, which then took place and led to the unity treaty by which uh, the GDR became or the GDR states became part of the Federal Republic after the 2 plus 9 treaty had been signed and the results of the 2 plus 4 treaty and the unity treaty were approved by the CSC at a conference in Paris. So after all this had been done, germ unification took place on October 3rd, 1990. I have the details in my paper and in my book. I come to my last point to sum up. My question is why and how was unification possible? I think coming back to what I said in the beginning that there were structural causes. Uh, the uh, structural changes in I the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe uh, 
had to be such a way that the East conflict could be overcome. And the East conflict was overcome by the structural changes it taking place. There were other elements to it. I think very much uh, was due to the close U.S.-German relations. The U.S.-German relations at that time, that year, were very close, and to some extent, uh, Bush and Kohl and Genscher and Baker cooperated very close, especially vis-a-vis -vis Gorbachev. So um, a number of arrangements were which the German Chancellor prides himself that he has reached, that he has uh, got from Gorbachev uh, the uh, promise that, that the concession that Germany could reunite uh, was a few days earlier was, was, was arranged, was, was discussed with, between Baker and Gorbachev. And also the question whether United Germany could become a member of NATO, uh, the, the talks in the Caucasus. A week before or some days before, there was a meeting in Camp David and Gorbachev was in Camp David and was talking with, uh, with Bush on this issue. Um, so I think uh, this, this was very important. Uh, equally important was a close German-French relations between Mitterrand and Kuhl and both of their support of European integration and that the Federal Republic was prepared to make concessions on European integration in order to facilitate unification on the EU budget and a few others, uh, which cause us some problems now. But anyhow, Kohl knew what the priorities were. Also, there were close, positive American-Soviet and German-Soviet relations, which, um, and the main decision breakthrough came after Gorbachev had been confirmed by the party congress. So he could, in July, I think it was, so he could act from a position of strength and could uh, negotiate difficult, for, difficult things for Russia, for the Soviet Union, the, with, with Germany and the West. There are many linkages in this process. Um, just to mention a few. Uh, there was a linkage between the treaty on the final settlement with respect to Germany, the 2 plus 4 treaty, and the Maastricht treaty. I've mentioned this. But one should not underrate this very close linkage. A second linkage was in the Charter of Paris, the CSC Charter, the conversion or the process of conversion of the CSC into OSC, strengthening its institutions. This again was a precondition for United Germany's membership in NATO. And uh, Germany, United Germany's membership in NATO was very much helped by the London Declaration and the Turnberry Summit in which um, NATO committed itself to transform itself, for not from an, 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 an uh, it stretched out its hand to the members of the Warsaw Pact and confirmed, declared it had no aggressive des um, designs and that nuclear weapons, although this happened later, nuclear weapons would be weapons of last resort and it was not a deterrent situation. But this was very important. This provided, I think, more than a face-saving uh, device for Gorbachev. Um, another important point was that Germany recognized international borders explicitly on top of existing agreement. This was important for Poland. Poland was very insecure, especially now with the strengthened Germany, a united Germany of 80 million inhabitants at its, at its western border. So uh, after a long haggling, uh, of which, about which I was very unhappy, the federal call the government and so explicitly recognized Polish, the Polish border, <coughs> had a special, uh, an additional treaty with Poland. The one reason Kohl was hesitant a bit was not on the border issue, but as you know, German chancellors are occasionally motiv motivated by domestic concerns. And he had elections coming up, and he was kind of concerned that refugee organizations would, uh, would vote against him. I didn't think this was a large issue, but anyhow, he, therefore, he was a little bit. Uh, but the recognition of the borders is very important. A last point, 
I put it deliberately at the last. Okay, yes, um, just uh, have, okay. Uh, German financial contributions to the Soviet economy and uh, on the uh, for the withdrawal of troops, and there were a couple of face saving things. But Germany paid up to 20 billion Deutsche Mark. Uh, aid to to uh, Soviet Union, which was at that time not terribly much. So my last point, and with this I was, wish to conclude, a window of because of the structural changes, a window of opportunity had been opened for a limited time. I'm not sure whether this would have gone through with Yeltsin, but it was possible. We talked about it this morning with Gorbachev, and this window of opportunity and the opportunities. Uh, <clears throat> associated, we are says, by skillful statesmen, above all, George H. Bush, Mikhail Gorbachev, Helmut Kohl, and François Mitterrand. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Helga. Lots of things for us to discuss uh, later on. We're very grateful to you. Sam? <coughs> well, I'm pleased to have an opportunity to comment on these two excellent papers. Uh, let me say before that, a uh, word of apology to all of you who happen to be sitting under one of these vents. Uh, we suffer from that in this building. We spent over $200,000 trying to get the heating uh, baffled and better controlled, and we did not succeed. But uh, I'll tell you one potential solution. We had a meeting here last September with President Hamid Karzai of Afghanistan. And as you know from his frequently uh, appearing pictures, he likes to wear a cape and he wears a nice little lamb's wool hat. Uh, looks very attractive, authentic. Uh, that's the image he likes to convey and he does a good job of it. He came into the room and he sat down and took his hat off and placed it there. And uh, when the first rotation of the baffles occurred and the cold air started coming through, he reached over and got his hat, put it on. <laughs> so for other meetings in this room, I would suggest either that or a shawl, and uh, you would be uh, well, well protected. Uh, these two papers are, as I indicated, both extremely strong. Uh, my only negative comment would be not to the authors, but to the way in which Cambridge structures these histories which means that the chapters are so short that you tend to work at a level of abstraction that uh, leaves no people in the essays themselves. Helga was able to work around that because she was working essentially through a level of high-level negotiations where the personalities are very important. Jacques had a much bigger problem he had to gallop through six revolutions in 25 pages, and that's not easy. I think he did an excellent job of it, as he did in his very concise summary of that paper here. But I would just urge the editors and the publisher to think about, at least in Jacques' case, allowing a few more pages to work in some people. Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> Thank so. you. But, uh, Jacques points out, and he takes it, it's very interesting when you look at the paper, the order in which he looks at his six revolutions is quite important. He takes, first of all, Poland and Hungary, the two most rebellious of the satellites, as we used to call them, and uh, he analyzes those in considerable detail. The others get somewhat lesser treatment, but the next pair are the good students by Moscow standards, that is, the GDR and Czechoslovakia, which were the most repressive, the most accepting of Soviet domination. Uh, his main theme is very well uh, elaborated through the course in which he shows how in each case there were tendencies in each government to look to Moscow for support, to try and buy time to see if they could intimidate people who were pressing for reform and change, and consistently, although somewhat ambiguously in the earlier uh, iterations, the message from Moscow came, you're on your own. We will not intervene with force. We do expect whatever reforms you make, and we encourage reform, we would like you to 
keep the socialist parties involved in political leadership, retain as much power as you can by however best you can arrange it, and by all means, please keep your state within the Warsaw Pact. This, this was the other uh, predominant theme, and as events accelerated after November of 89, that quickly broke down and it became clear, first the Hungarians and others were saying, we want to be out of the Warsaw Pact, we want Soviet troops out, and then the negotiations with the other powers came in and that became a clear prerequisite. Uh, Helga's paper reminds us that in this uh, episode, one of the trends prevailing in much of our studies of the Cold War in earlier periods does not apply. Uh, in that case, there developed something that in the early days, uh, in part spurred by Hope Harrison's study of the Berlin crises, we call tail wagging dog. Uh, that is, the so-called client states were in fact jerking around the Soviets and making things very difficult for Moscow, either by demanding more economic support or by demanding support for certain initiatives in curtailing uh, passage or refugees. Uh, in this particular case, we don't have that episode occurring at all. The uh, primacy of domestic politics is not so apparent, although, as Helga pointed out, there was an occasion in uh, Kohl's dealing with the Polish borders where there was a clear influence of domestic political agendas. Uh, it's interesting that in each of the communist governments looking to Moscow for guidance and support, uh, they had big debates about what message they were getting back. Not many got a direct message. In the case of the GDR, the leaders went to Moscow and they were directly told uh, in, in no uh, uncertain terms that they were on their own and that they strongly discouraged the use of force. So. Uh, there's a very interesting dynamic uh, with Moscow in each of these cases, and uh, that is one of the most interesting comparative points to analyze. Uh, I think really in the interest of time, it would be better spent to have you ask questions of the authors. Uh, the papers are excellent. You will have an opportunity to read them. Some of you will comment on them in the next couple of days, but uh, I commend the authors for <coughs> concise writing, well done. Thank you very much, Sam. We open up for questions and comments from the audience. Wojtek? And please use the microphone. Thank you. I have a question to Jacques, and it's about those limits of Soviet <coughs> tolerance that uh, uh, people so much speculated about. Would it be fair to say, in your opinion, that the Soviets themselves didn't know what are the limits of their tolerance at any particular time. At least I have seen no evidence of any discussions about that. And if so, I would have an explanation. At no time did they think of themselves to be on the defensive. Sure. Even as late as 1988, when Gorbachev was making all these concessions, he was explaining them as a, uh, as a clever sure. tactical move as a result of these concessions, we'll be able to be ahead. Yep. We shall beat the Americans in the competition. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, in the end, all limits disappeared. But why did they disappear? Mm -hmm. As a result of an accident described here by Helga, mm -hmm. which was the fall of the Berlin Wall. I mean, it can be properly described as an accident due to the stupidity of one guy, Gintoshabovsky, mm -hmm. which you described here so literally. Mm -hmm. yeah? If it had not been for him, the wall would not have fallen the way it did at the time That's it did. Right. Mm. So maybe we should also uh, pay some attention to the accidental factors in the end of the Cold War, uh, of which I would uh, put the fall of the Berlin Wall uh, on the top. Mm. I think there were certainly m many of them. Um, could, could I just add before turning to Jacques for this, uh, going back to the session this morning, I wonder how much of that is connected to this concept that Alex developed for us of competitive detente. Uh, almost in a, in, a, in a positive sense, that because the Soviet leaders, and Gorbachev himself especially, 
uh, was so intent on doing battle for uh, the souls of mankind, to use a term that will soon appear in print, um, that the transformation process became much easier than what it would have been under other yeah. circumstances. Yeah. And then secondly, a question to Jacques leading on from that, how important was the relationship to the United States in a direct sense from, from the Soviet Union in terms of making the decisions that they made? How much of this was Gorbachevian principle, the way outlined by Archie this morning, how much of it was knowing that any kind of stepping away from letting these processes take the uh, take the turn would mean some kind of confrontation with the United States. Well, there are many uh, questions. I think uh, uh, your your observation. I, I said that uh, at the beginning of my paper that the uh, emancipation of Eastern Europe was a surprise everywhere, uh, including in the in the, in the USSR itself. I mean, for Gorbachev himself, it, it was it was a surprise. He didn't expect that as a consequence of what he did. Uh, for instance, in the June 1989, he repudiated the Brezhnev doctrine in the most explicit way. He had done it before, but with some degree of probably calculated <laughs> ambiguity. But in a speech that he made in Western Europe in June 89, he, um, it was the most explicit denunciation of the, uh, of the Brezhnev doctrine. And of course, he didn't expect that as a result, something like the, the, the serial collapse of the uh, uh, East European regimes would occur. Of course, and I, I, I entirely agree with you that he was fully confident that, uh, and uh, Yakovlev kept repeating that, those who take bold initiative will retain uh, control of the process and uh, legitimacy can be regained by, both, uh, by uh, bold initiatives, by reform. That's the only way to keep in power, as a matter of fact. And uh, Yakovlev told me that he had an argument with Honecker, uh, because Honecker told him it's, it may lead to disaster what you are doing. And he said to Honecker, no, that's what, that's doing nothing nothing that will lead to a revolution more violent than the October Revolution. And the, other, the only way to keep in uh, power for the, is renew, to, to renew socialism, to go forward, and so on. So uh, he was absolutely confident for, well, for what was going on in Poland, in Hungary, was the right, the right thing to do. Uh, I said there wasn't an ambiguity in his policies, because at the same time, he, he, he supported reform where it occurred. But at the same time, he seemed to support the leaders who did not introduce reform. Of course, he was preaching uh, reform in, in philosophical terms to Yakesh and to the East Germans, but he did nothing to press them. And those um, uh, leaders in, Eastern, in East Germany and in uh, Czechoslovakia who sought support for, from Gorbachev in order to change, to have a regime change, to go uh, away similar to the Polish or the Iranian. They, they received no encouragement. There was an element of consistency, of course, in Gorbachev policies. It was hands off. Uh, it's, it's your own business, uh, but at the same time, uh, he, uh, the, the fact that you refuse to um, uh, support, uh, uh, to, to send clear signals to uh, reformers in East Germany in, uh, and uh, Czechoslovakia, I think he had a, a very heavy price to pay uh, for that, because if uh, Mod, someone like, that's what I, uh, I always argue, uh, if Mod, someone like Modro had uh, come to power at the beginning of 1989, all the opposition then was in favor of a separate socialist German state and so on, they would, in favor of rapprochement between the two Germany, they would have advocated a sort of confederation and so on, but things would have gone much lower. But they would have led eventually to a dissolution of the regime, but on different terms, in, uh, uh, intra-German terms and international terms. But uh, indeed, uh, right, uh, I think it's, it was a matter of overconfidence from Gorbachev that he... Uh, <coughs> Uh, uh, talk that these reforms would turn in socialism's favor. That is uh, both his uh, merit and his tragedy that, uh, that he didn't use force to stop the, the, the process when it uh, completely uh, uh, unraveled. To take uh, uh, up your question, I, I think what I s just said applies also mm -hmm. to relations with the United States. Uh, we all know that uh, in 89 there were some worries in the Moscow about what 
Bush uh, was about to, that he w was he really to going to engage uh, the USSR for good and so on. But at the same time, they were clearly um, uh, confident that uh, uh, Bush, for instance, when he went to Poland and Hungary, uh, Pravda was very, uh, uh, very b optimistic about it. He says uh, Bush is uh, supporting the same policies that we are supporting because he says that uh, change has to be uh, uh, to be incremental, to come gradually into the respect of the alliance system and so on. So they were quite confident that the state, the general state of the east-west relation, east -west relationship, was good enough to move to, towards a progressive um, uh, accommodation. And I, I remember a conversation that I had with, uh, with Andrei Grachev. I uh, asked him, uh, because he was close to Gorbachev uh, at a later stage, but still he was in the, in the uh, International Department of the Central Committee at that time. I said, uh, why is it that uh, uh, you didn't expect things to unravel the way they did? And he said, I think Eastern Europe, it was a secondary a priority for Gorbachev. It's not, it was not at all a priority. And he talked that with great power consultation, mm. the, the process could be controlled by, the, by, uh, by great power understandings. Well, and of course, the way it, uh, it happened, the, mm. even with some will on the Western side to slow down events, they could not be slowed down. Yeah. Yeah. At least it, may, it made the possibility for a crackdown much, much less likely, because exactly. that would have been a, that exactly. would have been a break. Exactly. Um, Alex Pravda, Mary, is your question related to the same issues here? N no, okay, Alex then. Yeah, mine is to, to Wojtek as well. Uh, I absolutely agree with your notion of ambiguity, and I'm curious to explore further, you've explored some of this, the, the, the nature of Moscow's ambiguity. Mm. As far as I can oh. see, um, Gorbachev gave them two, two sets of signals. One was expectation of moving to Perestroika, and thereby creating in each of those microsystems an expectation within the elite and within the population that something would happen. He refused point blank to give them a strategy by which to achieve it, saying, that's up to you. All you need to know is we won't help if it goes wrong. So that froze, as we know, you know polarized them. Some went for fast forward and some froze. My question, though, is about mixed signals, because the Gorbachev one was, as you say, this, this, this rather contradictory one, plus the fact you mentioned of indifference. I mean, Chernayev and others say they couldn't get him to see East Europeans often. They had to really force the meetings, because he didn't want to do with these, these guys. He was, he was working at a stratospheric level of you know, large diplomacy and want this small stuff. But the mixed signals are interesting. What other people were at work? And we know the KGB, the Khrushchev was going around, GDR and Hungary in particular, his old beats. Conservatives, uh, Likachov was involved in East European matters. So what I'm interested in from the point of view of the East European elites who were going and trying to find out like mad what the limits were in Moscow, uh, whether there was a lot of confusion because of the mixed signaling from Moscow with different levels saying different things and different people telling them. And they couldn't make a judgment because Gorbachev wouldn't commit himself. Exactly. Mm. Yeah. I think yeah, you're absolutely right. I remember a conversation that I had with uh, uh, the first advisor of uh, Imre Pozhgai, the Hungarian reformer, and he told me that we were absolutely in the dark as far as the correlation of forces was, uh, what it was in the Kremlin. Uh, we, uh, we knew that Gorbachev was in favor of reform, but we didn't know what kind of room of maneuvers he had. He was not, he was in his speech, favoring reform uh, everywhere as a, as a solution to the problems of socialism, renovation of socialism, and so on. We could think that it did apply to us, but we didn't receive any clear sign. Uh, of course, well, Gorbachev, he supported the reformers where reformers were in power, and he showed well, in, in his uh, official uh, meeting, not only in his official, in, in even private meetings with Yakesh, with Toniker, and so on, he seemed to, uh, to nearly support them. So it was very, for second-ranking communists, to, um, it, it's very difficult to take an initiative in such a repressive system. It is very risky if you don't have any clear signal that you will be supported and, and protected from, from outside, which Gorbachev systematically avoided to, uh, to do. That's what I call, uh, and, and there's more than that. Uh, uh, when, I terms, uh, uh, when I speak of uh, ambiguity, he met with Yakesh 
uh, in the summer of 1989. It is very late. Many reforms had been undertaken in Poland and Hungary and so on. And he was telling to him, well, we, uh, uh, Czechoslovakia is well placed to introduce reform because you have a good standard of living. It will be well received and so on. But at the same time, in order to reassure uh, Jakes, she said, uh, well, uh, you know our position uh, for the Prague Spring. It, it turned into a counter-revolution. That's incredible in 89. A few months before, he had accepted the revision of the Hungarian Revolution, which, I, which was 10 times more radical than uh, the um, um, uh, uh, Czech uh, Prague Spring. So going out of that meeting, of course, um, uh, uh, Jakes could claim, and rightly so, that Gorbachev shares our own vision of the Prague Spring and so on. So that it was somewhat discouraging for those in the Czechoslovak uh, regime and, uh, and of course to the uh, leaders of the Prague Spring that were already there around in, uh, beginning with Dubček. So that's, that, that is uh, what I mean when I say that the capacity of the East European regimes and uh, the Czechoslovak regime to resist change was due not only to that but to a certain extent to ambiguities in Soviet points that were lifted only after the opening of the Berlin Wall. Mary? Uh, thank you very much. My question arises from a comment that you made, Frau Professor Hoftendorn, about the way that we should not underestimate the connection between the two plus four talks and the Maastricht Agreement. And I'd like to ask about a problem that Arna has highlighted, which is the disconnect between scholarship on the history of the Cold War and scholarship on the history of the European Union. To a certain extent, that happens because we're looking at different levels. As historians, either we're looking at the big picture, the international system, or individual nations and states. Scholars of the European Union are often looking at institutions, something right in between. So I'd be interested to hear from both of the panelists, what is the connection between European unification in the late 1980s and unification? In particular, as you know, your former Harvard colleague, Andrew Moravchik, mm -hmm. Your former Harvard colleague, Andrew Moravchik, oh, yeah. has argued explicitly that there is no connection whatsoever between German unification and European unification, that the way Germany acted towards Europe before and after 1989 had been set many years ago and was not impacted in any way by unification. So my question is, is the, if that's true, and do you agree with that is the first question, if that's true that German unification had no impact on European unification, is the reverse true as well? I don't agree with Andy. I think Andy Moravchik might be right up to 1988-89, but uh, you you see the documents. You the what is available are both the letters between Kuhl and Mitterrand and the um, the, the reports on the meetings. You can read them word by word. Um, and it is very visible how the two gentlemen uh, or the two politicians are moving or itching, making their way toward each other, uh, skeptical in the beginning. I mean, I had, my memory is not terribly good on some of the details, especially uh, right now I'm working on something very, very different. But there was a call visited Mitterrand at his um, uh, vacation place uh, in southern France in early January. And at that time, Mitter uh, Mitterrand made it very clear to Kohl that he expected Kohl to approve in progress on the economic and on monetary union. The EMS, the European Monetary <coughs> System, was very important for uh, for. Mitterrand. The reason was that uh, Mitterrand was facing a Germany of 80, 000, of 80 million inhabitants. This, of course, uh, which is larger uh, than France with something like 60,000 million inhabitants and has a larger GNP. So Mitterrand wanted to frame in the economic power of the Federal Republic in, in, uh, uh, in, uh, in European monetary and economic system which had more supranational institutions on it than uh, at the time the EVS, the, the old European uh, currency system which uh, Helmut Schmidt 
and uh, Giscard d'Estaing developed in the, in the late 1970s. This is very, very visible. And uh, even if you go back a little bit further, there was a meeting in early December in Strasbourg among the, uh, the, the, the heads of government of the European countries. And Kohl, in his memoirs, describes it that this was the most ugly meeting he had been in for a long time because not just of Maggie Thatcher, who was really firing cannonballs at Kohl at, at this meeting, but also the skepticism of Mitterrand. So uh, you can e very well see how the two gentlemen uh, moved towards each other. And I be be do believe that uh, German unification would not have been possible at that speed, in spite of George W. Bush or Gorbachev. Uh, the documents are all out and they are readable. I don't uh, agree with Frédéric Bozo. We had this argument in Paris because Paris thinks, and Frédéric has written a very, very good book on Mitterrand and German unification. And it's a very, very good book. It's in French, but it's a very good book, uh, although I couldn't. <laughs> Nonetheless. <laughs> uh, I've read it, but. Uh, no, someone thinks some... Frederick has to say sound much better in French than I would in any other language. <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, I mean, uh, but um, he argues that Mitterrand was all for your unification. I don't agree with him, and I have lots of documents from the German side uh, which prove it differently. However, I would ask you to be cautious about memoirs. Be cautious both about Mitterrand's memoirs and be cautious about Kohl's memoirs. Kohl's memoirs are very tainted. Um, and uh, Kohl basically follows Attali's argument vis-a-vis -vis Mitterrand. And you could see that Kohl says a few things in his memoirs which are not in the documents. So, um, and also with one or two papers in the project where people cite all these, uh, these, these memoirs as primary documents. Be careful about it. But um, I, on your question, Mary, I think there is a strong connection. And um, I mean, this also, uh, increased Maggie Thatcher's opposition to German unification because she was very, very of European integration. She w didn't want to have the currency union. Mm -hmm. And uh, these things added together. I'm not sure, and I really should know more because I don't read Russian. At a very early stage of my academic career or as a high school student, I decided that I didn't want to learn Russian. So I went a bit further west where I, I had English and French in school and not, not Russian, so I'm not very well informed. But of course, uh, Gorbachev in some of his talks mentioned that he hoped that the European integration would be would he could what Soviet Union could strike some kind of relationship with it. Mm. I think the, um, at least the memoirists to come have to uh, be very careful with this because uh, I stressed the difficulties with regard to sources for this period at the outset. Now, on 1989 itself, 1989-91 in the case of Germany, we do actually have a fairly decent source base. Yeah. Uh, in part through German documents that have been published, uh, the Bundeskanzleramt uh, uh, collections especially, but also from the Soviet side, uh, uh, Svetlana could talk more about this, when there's an enormous number of uh, conversations at the highest levels that have been made available by the by the Gorbachev Foundation. We're also getting more now, uh, both in France uh, and in in Britain. It's actually only from the American side that there is yeah. an absolute lock yeah. on yeah. access to materials yeah. dealing with the 80, 90, yeah. 91 period. But if I may come in, I yeah. think the book uh, the book by Condoleezza by Phil Zellico and Condoleezza Rice is quite factual. I have checked some of their statements with the documents, and I think they are f very reliable. They are just a few instances. Of course, Bush is greater. Bush, uh, uh, George H. Bush is greater than everybody else, but uh, otherwise, I think it's, it's very, I could, one could use it as a documentary, so as far as I know. 
on that note, Hope Harrison. <laughs> Hope Harris and George Washington University. Um, well, I usually hate counterfactual questions, but this morning got me going, and your comments, Jacques, about the importance of, uh, and the way Helga described Gunter Schabowski's mistake at the press conference, opening the wall, and your point about East Europe in its entirety uh, hurling itself through the Berlin Wall. I love that image. How do you think things might have been different if there wasn't that mistake made on November 9th and that wall wasn't opened, how, how might things have continued to develop in Eastern Europe and you know, how different might things have been? Well, uh, yeah, Jack, why don't you do, do that one first and then have it. Thank you. Jack, you, you, you no. go first. Well, I like to speculate on something earlier because <laughs> if uh, the wall had not been opened on the November 9, there could have been some popular explore, give, given what was going on again in Poland all over the place. So if the wall had not been opened, there could have been some riots, violence, and so on. And I think, I think things could have gotten very wrong. Uh, the uh, uh, more interesting scenarios that I have in mind when I do some counterfactuals, if, uh, w what would happen if reforms had been introduced uh, uh, earlier, as late as mid-1989, uh, both in Czechoslovakia and in East uh, Germany. In Czechoslovakia, for instance, if the, if the uh, Prague Spring proponents had been rehabilitated, Dubček would have uh, easily won um, popular, f entirely free election sometime at the end of uh, November. This would have led probably, by, be, 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 because this was what we call in French the tendance lourde, uh, the, the regime would have eventually dissolved, that, but at a much slower pace. Same thing applies, I think, to East Germany. If Modro and some reformers had gotten in power at the beginning of 89, all the, as I said before, all the opposition was in favor of keeping some sort of of uh, German socialism, a different German state together with the rapport. So I think the pace of events would have changed. I think the, dissol the gradual dissolution of the communist regime would have taken place, but much less rapidly and in a, an entirely inter a different international con uh, uh, context. So uh, I think Gorbachev's project for a new European order, saving the two alliance, the antagonized and so on, but building a new pan-European security system and so on, all of this could have been uh, possible uh, if the transformation then be more gradual and under control. Uh, but uh, I, I think when the Berlin Wall was opened, uh, things were, had, had gone very far and popular explosions would have happened in p probably in East Germany. Something of that sort had not been done. Well, uh, w one may think also that uh, without the, the complete opening, what was contemplated, it was a, a, a free visa system, a free exit uh, p permit given to any citizen. Of course, this would have probably slowed the process too. I slightly differ with Jack. I don't, I'm not so sure whether there would have been more riots and so on, because I consider uh, the events of November 4th in East Berlin, in Dresden, and in Leipzig, the Monday demonstration, pretty close to riot. But um, I, on the other hand, I think that some reform of the travel law, uh, which the SED the Central Committee de had decided on on November 9 was an integral part of the reform strategy of the Krenz government. So um, there are two options or two possible ways to speculate about it. One could have been that there was a continuous process of liberalization, that people were permitted to go to the West that would, ha would have taken some of the pressure off not everything, some of the pressure, and there were some in West Germany, especially on the left and among the SPD, who didn't, long, didn't want to have a unification, but rather were thinking of a liberalized GDR. So this would have been the one thing. And the second would be that this would not have been enough, and then there would be increasing pressure, like there was pressure to replace a Krenz then uh, by Modro and, uh, and, and so on. So I find, of course, it's behind speculation by hindsight. I think, unfortunately, we will have to bring this um, session to a close. 
I want to thank both the um, presenters, uh, Jack Levesk and, and Helga Haftendon. I want to thank uh, Sam Wells for his comments, for the, to the audience, for your very good questions. We reconvene here at 4 p.m. sharp for the final session, which will take us in a slightly different direction out of the political landings of the Cold War. And